Good morning. I welcome you all for today's discussion on hydraulic turbines. In the last uh, couple of lectures, we talked about pumps and we talked about the classification of pumps. In the same way, we will start the discussion on hydraulic turbines by first making the classification of hydraulic turbines. Before we go into hydraulic turbines, let me show you a schematic or picture of hydroelectric power plant. Many of us, maybe some of you have also visited some dams. You could see on one side of the dam, there will be a big pool of water, which we call the reservoir and through the dam, the, at the base of the dam, you will have a power house, which has a typically a turbine as shown here. As water flows from the duct, it comes to the turbine. This is called a pen stock. It comes to the turbine. The, these turbine blades will rotate. There is a, a generator connected at the top, which converts these rotations into electric current and then it goes out of the power house for distribution and that is how we generate hydroelectricity. Now, it is not necessary in general that a hydraulic turbine will always have a dam. Recent works are showing on low head turbines with no dam or very small check dams or barrages. But the turbines that we are going to discuss today in this lecture are all big turbines. So, for that dam and reservoir that we are showing here schematically are essential components. So, that means we need to classify the hydro power plant projects into certain categories. These categories may vary from country to country these numbers, the names remain same, pico, micro, mini, small, etcetera, the names remain same, but these values that are given, the capacity values can change from country to country, what I am showing is for India specific. So, in India we talk about pico power plant stations or pico hydro power projects, which produces 5 kilowatt or below. This is basically used for a system where you produce power locally and use it. It is not really for transmission and going to the grid, usually that is the scenario. Then we can have micro hydropower projects which is up to 100 kilowatt. Between 101 kilowatt to 2 megawatt, we can talk about a mini hydropower project. Above 2 megawatt and up to 25 megawatt, we talk about a small hydropower project and above that we have the large hydral power stations. So, this is the classification which we normally have and for these larger power stations, we really have the dams and the turbines that we are going to talk about. So, some basic concepts that we need to be clear at the very beginning. In case of pump for example, we had talked about the head developed by the pump. Here we are talking about what is the head utilized by the turbine. So, we can say that there is a headrest level. You can imagine that this headrest level is nothing but the reservoir we have talked about and there is a tail rest level that the downstream side of the turbine and in between the headrest level and the tail rest level, we have a turbine which is installed. So, we have a piping system which we call the penstock which brings the water through the turbine. Now, you may say that this level difference, this geodetic level difference between the headrest level and the tail rest level is the head available. Yes, it is true it is the head available, it is called the gross head or H g in my notations. So, this gross head is nothing but the geodetic level difference between the head rest level and tail rest level. However, whenever there is a flow, there will be some losses associated with it, there can be approach loss, there can be exit losses and hence what is available to the turbine for extraction of power is not Hg. What is available is the energy available with the fluid before it enters the turbine here and the energy available with the flow as it leaves the turbine. And this is given by another symbol called H net or H. So, this H is called the net head as opposed to Hg which is the gross head and the difference between the two is accounted for by the losses. I am not going into what are the different losses at this stage. 
it is not required. So, whenever we do discuss about head utilized by the turbine unless specifically mentioned we always refer to the head or the net head. Thus, we can say that net head or head is equal to Hg minus loss and this is strictly speaking should be called net head, but we use the term head and we can say that if there were no losses in the turbine if we assume that the turbine to be an idealized machine which it is not in reality then the ideal or the theoretical power that will be transmitted by this turbine is P theoretical T h here stands for theoretical or ideal is rho V dot G h. But as we have discussed in thermodynamics and also when we talked about the different losses in the earlier classes, we said that no machine can be 100 percent efficient. We also discussed different losses that are present. For example, we talked about hydraulic losses, we have talked about inside the hydraulic losses, we have talked about the friction losses as well as the shock or incidence loss, we have talked about the leakage loss, we have talked about this friction loss we have talked about return flow loss. Now, return flow loss in case of turbine is not very significant and the disc friction loss is generally applicable for turbines except for the turbine which is moving in air. So, we will talk about Pelton turbine which actually moves in air. So, you have to account for these different losses and what we ultimately get from the turbine is the coupling power P c which is given by omega the rotational speed times t and the ratio of the two is called the overall efficiency. This was already talked about in when we discussed the losses, but I am bringing it here because this is the central concept that we have to keep in mind the ideal power, the actual power and the efficiency. Okay. So, now when we come to the turbines we can classify the turbines in different ways just like we can classify any turbo machine we have discussed in general. So, we can say that based on head and discharge example qualitatively speaking I can say high head, medium head, low head or alternatively I can say high volume flow rate, medium volume flow rate or low volume flow rate, but the problem of this way of classifying is that how high is high, what is high and what is low these are not very well defined. So, we have to talk about in another way, I will come to that next. So, right now we will talk about based on the action of water on the moving blades and we can say that the turbines can be classified into two categories, one is impulse type of turbine another one is reaction type of turbine. You already know the definition of impulse type of turbine, impulse type of hydraulic turbine is a hydraulic turbine in which there is no change of static pressure in the impeller or the runner or the rotor blades. Reaction turbine is one in which there is a change in the pressure. So, different types of impulse turbines are possible, Pelton turbine, Targo turbine, and bunky or cross flow turbine and similarly reaction turbines can be different types Francis, Darius, Propeller and Kaplan. And you see that some of these Pelton, Francis and Kaplan I have marked in red because this is what I am going to cover in today's lectures. We are trying to talk about Pelton turbine in the next lecture in the next class we will talk about Francis and Kaplan turbines. So, in this course on fluid dynamics and turbo machines in we are going to cover these three turbines in some detail. I will touch upon propeller turbine in my next lecture as well. So, we continue with the classification of hydraulic turbines we can say based on the direction of flow of water in the runner and we can say that it can be a tangential flow in case of Pelton turbine this will become clear when we see the picture of Pelton turbine or it can be mixed flow in case of Francis or axial flow in case of Kaplan or propeller turbine. So, this picture will become clearer when we talk about the different turbines in some detail and we can also tell in based on the, the arrangement of the turbine shaft, the shaft can be arranged in the vertical or in the horizontal direction. But the best way of classifying a turbo machine as we have all discussed is based one on specific speed or shape number 
we will use the specific speed definition here for hydraulic turbines. And based on it, we can say that if the specific speed range is between 10 and 35, we would prefer Pelton turbine. If it is between 60 and 300, it is Francis turbine and above 300, it is usually Kaplan turbine. And to remind you, this definition of specific speed N s is given as N under root P c, which is the coupling power whole divided by h to the power 5 by 4. Please note that it is 5 by 4, whereas in case of pump in the last class, we have talked about with h to the power 3 fourth. And also please note that this coupling power is in metric horsepower, which is you can always convert from watt or kilowatt into metric horsepower. And then n is in rpm and h is in meters. Now, you may say what is wrong if I use uh, Pelton turbine in case of let us say a specific speed in the range of 120 to 180. The reason is that you will not get the best efficiency. So, we are talking about uh, using a particular type of turbine where the efficiency should be highest. So, that has to be always kept in mind while determining which turbine is more appropriate. So, some of the hydraulic turbine installations in India are I am just given examples where Pelton, Francis or Kaplan turbines are involved. Pelton turbine is seen in Missouri hydroelectric power plant on the Skiarkuli river. The Francis turbine is seen in the Bhakra dam and Kaplan turbine is found in the Hirakud dam. This some of the values of the operating conditions are given. You can calculate the specific speeds and see whether these satisfy. Now, we will start with Pelton turbine. Let us first see an overall arrangement of Pelton turbine. The Pelton turbine essentially has a wheel or the drum which is the runner which rotates and on it some you can see the these are called buckets, these are connected. We have a nozzle which brings water, these are water jets which hits this bucket and as a result the bucket rotates in the direction shown by this curly arrow. Also, we have what inside this nozzle what is known as a spear arrangement. I will talk about the spear arrangement in detail because it deserves a special mention. Of course, I will talk about the bucket as well and in some cases we have the brake nozzles. You see that the flow coming out of the main nozzle actually tries to take the bucket as shown in the direction. The water that is coming out of the brake nozzle that will come out of the brake nozzle hits on the opposite surface and is trying to act against the main direction of rotation. So, it tries to slow down the turbine. When do we require it? We will see it shortly. So, these are the essential components. We also have more often than not a casing surrounding this Pelton turbine. Now, one thing we have to be very clear. When we say Pelton turbine and we have said it is an impulse turbine, so what does it mean? Pressure does not change. And in this case, this jet of water issuing out of the nozzle is coming out in open atmosphere. So, that means the Pelton turbine is essentially rotating under the impact of this jet of water striking the buckets in air. Now, if it is in open air and the pressure is constant, then why do we need a casing? Yes, that is a good question. The casing is not required for any hydraulic requirement. It is actually for our safety and also for preventing splashing of water. We will see that when we talk about reaction turbines in the next class, we will see that casing is very, very important component there. Okay. So, this is the overall arrangement of a Pentan turbine. Now, we will talk about each of these components in some detail, particularly the nozzle and the spear and the bucket, which we can say are like the main components in case of a Pelton turbine. So, first we will start with nozzle and spear. In a cartoon form, in a schematic form, this is the nozzle, the nozzle exits here and the jet comes out. I have intentionally shown it in an exaggerated way. This is the portion which has the least diameter, the vena contractor and of course, that is the remaining portion of the penstock. Now, we have a spear 
which is kept inside the nozzle. This spear can move, it can go and try to close the nozzle or it can open further. This reciprocating motion if required, if the positioning of the uh, spear inside the nozzle that is if it is retracted fully or brought in fully or kept somewhere in between, this dictates what will be the volume flow rate. So, we can say that this volume flow rate happens because of the location of the sphere and of course, the head available to the turbine, but why do we need such an arrangement. You can say that making this spear will be more expensive. We could have always done this work with the help of some simple valves. For example, in our home when we want to control the water coming out in a tap, the tap itself is a valve. We are trying to close it, open it as we wish. So, why do we need it? The reason is because we want minimum loss in this nozzle and hence what we want is the minimum restrictions in terms of the flow rates that is possible without incurring major loss and hence the spear is an essential component we cannot use any valves. And we can define few diameters d 0 is a nominal diameter of the nozzle exit and d j is the diameter of the jet or jet diameter and more often than not we will use this jet diameter d j than d 0. And typical angle for nozzle is the 2 beta is the angle of the nozzle we have used is 84 degrees and typical angle for the spear is 50 to 60 degrees. We are now going to talk more about the nozzle and the jet diameter. We can say that the volume that is coming out the in the form of jet is given by V dot which is pi by 4 d j square that is the jet diameter. Uh, the area corresponding to the jet diameter and multiplied by C j and what is C j? C j is nothing but some constant times root 2 g h. How do you visualize the root 2 g h? You have studied in fluid dynamics that if we have a tank and we have water coming out of the tank, then what is the velocity that you get? The velocity is obtained by the change of potential energy. So, the kinetic energy is obtained by the change of potential energy and hence velocity will be nothing but root 2 g h. So, the jet is coming out in atmospheric condition because of the head imposed on the turbine which is capital H and hence the velocity should be proportional to root 2 g h. But why is that k n? K n is called the nozzle velocity coefficient which varies from 0.98 to 0.99. What does it show? That it is almost like an idealized state of 1. C j would have been root to g h if there is no loss anywhere, but because of very minimal loss we find that k n is close to 1 not exactly 1. And we can write that d j is equal to under root 4 v dot by pi k n under root 2 g h. So, this is obtained from the relationship between v dot and c j given earlier. We can in the same way write in the nominal diameter of the nozzle in terms of the volume flow rate and a nozzle coefficient which is k c 0 which is magnitude of 0.81 to 0.83. So, these are the most important diameters as far as the jet is concerned. Now, this jet will uh, hits the runner. So, what will happen is this impact will now cause this motions. The momentum change will take place and will cause the motion. Let us now look at what happens there. When we talk about this specific speed, we have to also keep in mind the usual definition of the specific speed we have given n under root p c by h to the power 5 by 4 we have the usual uh, definition. So, n is in rpm, p c is in metric horsepower or for the time being we can say that it is close to kilowatt and h is in meters. In case of multiple jets in Pelton turbine I have shown you the example where there is only one jet. If there are multiple jets up to 6 jets are possible, these jets can hit the Pelton turbine bucket 
from 6 different locations and in this case the power output will be more and we can say that n s j is nothing but j is the number of um, jets. So, is nothing but n under root j times p c whole divided by h to the power 5 by 4. And hence we can say that if there are j number of jets then n s j is under root j times n s. This is the relationship you have to use. Why is it important? Because you saw in case of Pelton turbine, the Pelton turbine can work between 10 to 35 and you have also seen that Francis turbine works in the range of 60 and above. Now, you may come across a situation where the specific speed lies between 35 and 60. So, what will you do? You can use multiple jets and try to accommodate that specific speed requirement. So, you see that even if I say that the specific speed of an individual uh, one jet uh, Pelton turbine is 35, if you have 4 jets then under root of 4 will give you 2 you are going close to 70. So, you are actually bridging the gap between 35 to 60. So, that is where many times the multiple jets are used, but there is a restriction that you cannot go more than 6 from the practical considerations. So, this is an important aspect about the jet choice of the number of jets or number of nozzles you need to produce the power. Now, we want to talk about the Pelton wheel diameter or Pelton runner. So, this is my schematic of the jet hitting a Pelton bucket. In the next slide, we will talk more about the bucket. So, this hits the bucket and as a result of the momentum change, we will find that there is a net rotation is taking place in the direction shown by the arrow. This d is called the pitch circle diameter. This is where these Pelton buckets are connected with the runner or the wheel. Many times it is called the Pelton wheel. So, on the uh, in the wheel we have to connect or fasten these uh, buckets. Now, we can say that if the rotational rpm is n then u is nothing but pi n d by 60. Now, what causes this rotation? It is the jet which is impinging on the buckets. So, that means in a way it is related with the net head which is available for this turbine and hence we can say that u is equal to k u times under root 2 g h and we can say that k u is blade speed ratio which varies between 0.44 2.46 and hence we can find out the diameter or the pitch circle diameter capital D as 60 k u times under root 2 g h by pi n. Working speed of a turbine depends on the nature of the driven unit. If an electrical generator has to be connected we are directly coupling to the turbine then what happens we should know that the frequency of the operations in case of let us say alternator in India is 50 hertz. So, this frequency has to be matched because we are sending the power back to the grid and hence we cannot have any arbitrary speed and this rotational speed is given by 120 f by p where p is the number of poles of the magnet that we have in the alternator. So, this has to be kept in mind. The another thing that is very important from the design perspective of a Pelton turbine is the jet ratio. This jet ratio which is often given by the symbol m is given as the mean diameter of the runner or the pitch circle diameter of the runner capital D divided by the least diameter of the jet or so called the jet diameter d j. Typically for a good or a ideal design of a Pelton turbine this value of m should lie between 11 and 14. This is more from the design perspectives, but it is good to know these quantities because this is what characterizes a Pelton turbine. The next or uh, the most important component perhaps is this bucket. Now, this bucket is shown I will also show you a small model bucket which is not really used for power generation, but it is more for classroom demonstrations and for demonstrations like I am going to do now. Let us look at this bucket first before we continue this discussion. Imagine that 
this is my finger is the point where this bucket is fastened to the wheel and the water jet is coming and hitting the bucket. As a result the water comes here this has a very sharp edge you can see this very sharp edge this is called a splitter edge as the name suggests this splits the jet into two hubs it goes here one part of the jet comes out like this the other part of the jet comes out like this. So, as a result of the momentum change we get an angle from the angular momentum conservation we find the torque and this entire system will move. As this jet hits this bucket and the bucket moves the next bucket comes from top because the wheel as I have shown you had multiple buckets. You can also find out how many buckets are required, but that I will not discuss in today's lecture. So, you see that as the bucket comes here it hits it goes and the next bucket comes and hits. It is done in such a way that we do not waste the water. So, this is called the splitter edge and we have uh, two cup like structures which I will discuss with the powerpoint slides I am presenting and more detail now. So, if you want to compare the picture that you see on the slide with this one then it should be viewed in this fashion. You can see the view which is shown and I am taking a section x x as shown on the slide and let us look at this section x x in some more detail. So, coming back to the slide we see that the bucket the splitter edge is also visible now you can imagine a line joining here is a splitter edge and you are taking a section x x and viewing this section. You see that this is the splitter edge which is a very sharp one and as the name suggests this splits water I will show you some uh, schematic of the water being split and this water will go and leave in this fashion. This beta 1 is the exit angle. So, let us look at it slightly more carefully with the schematics. So, this is the same uh, section which I showed you in the last slide and I have just taken the outline of it this angle between the which is tangent to these two curves is called the splitter angle 2 beta s beta s is the splitter angle and 2 beta s is the total splitter angle because of symmetry it is 2 beta s. So, water jet comes from the right it hits the splitter edge it goes round the blade as I told you as I showed you and then it comes out. So, now think about the flow direction in the absence of any turbine blade any belt and turbine bucket this is the flow direction had there been no bucket the flow would have continued undisturbed. Now, because of the presence of the bucket the flow leaves at an angle beta 1 and hence there is a deflection delta and you can see that this delta is very large quite close to 180 degree. Let us digress from Pelton turbine and look back what you have studied in fluid dynamics portion of this course. You have done momentum conservation and you perhaps have also studied that you have plate which is C type which is just imagine only this portion of the plate is there it is not a Pelton turbine bucket it is just a plate then the flow comes here and leaves by 180 degree why we have that 180 degree you have done the problems to show that it has the maximum momentum transfer and the maximum force. Now, that maximum force will give rise to the maximum torque. So, this kind of C structure for this blade is desirable when we are trying to generate the maximum force because of the change in direction. There is no change in pressure I repeat this is an impulse turbine this bucket is in uh, atmospheric condition. So, there is no change in pressure what causes this force is the simply the direction change and hence ideally it should have been 180 degree. Now, in the real configuration 180 degree is not possible because as I told you that there is not just one bucket 
there are many buckets which are arranged on the uh, Pelton wheel. Now, as one bucket is hit by the jet, it moves the neighboring bucket comes in. So, if this deflected jet has to go back, it will hit the neighboring jet, which is not desirable. And hence, we have a deflection angle delta, which is quite close to 180 degree, but not 180 degree. Actually, the value will be between 165 to 170 degrees. And the other angle is the splitter edge. When we have the splitter edge, we actually have typically between 7 degrees and 15 degrees, but many times we may solve the problem, many times we may do the first cut design assuming that these are actually not having any angle between the axis in the direction of the jet and the plates deviations. So, we can say that if no information is given, if any problem you have to solve, then you can take beta s to be 0. So, you understand, but now you may say why do I need two of this C like structures, why do not we have a Pelton bucket which is simpler to make with just one half, because that itself gives me a large turning angle of delta and I will get a large force. This is because we are also trying to balance the normal force. So, you see that initially the jet is coming in the horizontal direction, when it leaves, it leaves with two components one along horizontal, one along the normal. So, that means, if we are thinking in terms of forces, we will experience f x as well as f y. Now, this force which is tangential is actually desirable, because that tangential force gives rise to the torque, but the normal force is not desirable. And hence, if we have a symmetric structure here, then it will balance or neutralize this f x here by the f x at the bottom. And hence, we may not have any significant normal thrusts. And this splitter actually ensures that the division or the flow is turning around in both directions properly. So, this is why this structure however complicated it looks is very important and hence the bucket design is very important part for the Pelton turbine design. Okay. Let us continue with the discussion further, because we have to construct the velocity triangles. The reason why I am trying to spend these things slowly is because unlike the Pelt, uh, Francis and Kaplan turbines which we will talk in the next class, Pelton turbine is structurally slightly different. So, let us start again with the water jet hitting the bucket and this is the pitch circle diameter as we have said, the direction of rotation is also given. So, if we look at this portion more carefully, we can say that if we view it, this is the Pelton turbine bucket, this is the splitter edge and this water is jet is coming. Essentially, we are looking from this side and once it comes, if we construct a plane, then we can see that the water will come and leave like this and that gives rise to these dotted lines. So, now when I look at these dotted lines more carefully, I get the shape of the bucket and you see that u is the velocity uh, uh, the rotational velocity, w 2 and c 2 are our usual definitions of relative velocity and the absolute velocity respectively and we are talking about 2 as a subscript means this is the high pressure side the inlet for these turbines. And we see that this is leaving flow is leaving this is w 1 tangentially and of course, u does not change we are talking about u based on this diameter and this small height difference is negligible and hence u 1 equal to u 2 and we are talking about the absolute velocities. So, looking at the velocity triangles now more closely, we can bring the cartoon of the uh, Pelton bucket and look at it at the pressure side as well as at the suction side. So, our usual symbols of u C 2 and W 2 is given. So, if you see the flow comes like this and leaves. So, the ax, uh, angle between this axis and this direction is half of these 2 beta s or it is beta s and hence from our definition of beta 2, this is nothing but 180 degree minus beta s. 
So, this has to be borne in mind. If in some problems or in some designs you do not want beta s, then beta 2 is 180 degree that we will talk about later on. So, right now we are talking about the generalized case that is we have a beta s which is non zero. We similarly, we can talk about the exit or the outlet of the blade and the flow leaves tangentially which is given here by w 1 and we have beta 1 and alpha 1. And if there is no friction, since the pressure has to be constant, we get w 1 equal to w 2. However, friction may also be present and in that case the friction will reduce the relative velocity and we have w 1 is k times w 2 where k is less than 1. So, depending on what is given in the problem you may choose w 1 equal to w 2, but if specifically it is given that the friction is reducing the velocity and we have a factor of k then that has to be accommodated. And in that case also please note that this relative velocity is whether it is w 1 equal to w 2 or w 1 equal to k w 2 the pressure is still atmospheric and there is no change in static pressure. So, I repeat if nothing is mentioned choose frictionless flow that is k equal to 1. Now, we will talk about the specific work W B L and we also the power. So, we say that uh, in coming to specific work and power we can say that W B L is equal to u c 2 u minus c 1 u. Why is that? Because u 1 equal to u 2 equal to u and we can write C 2 u in terms of u minus w 2 u or u minus w 2 cos beta 2. Please keep the velocity triangle in mind and we can further say from the exit velocity triangle that C 1 u is nothing but u minus w 1 u which is u minus w 1 cos beta 1. And now, we can relate w 1 and w 2 like w 1 is k times w 2 and we can take w 2 out and we can write w b l equal to u w 2 times minus cos beta 2 plus w 1 is replaced as k times w w 2 and hence k remains k times cos beta 1. Of course, it is possible that we may have do, do some simplifications and if we say that beta s is equal to 0 then what happens to beta 2? Beta 2 is nothing but 180 degree and this triangle which you have seen at the inlet degenerates into a straight line. So, we will have C 2 u and w 2 all along one line and we say that w 2 is nothing but C 2 minus u. I may also add here that this C 2 is nothing but the jet velocity which is C j. The jet velocity that comes out of the nozzle, we assume that the same velocity reaches that uh, uh, Pelton turbine bucket and hence C 2 equal to C j. So, we can say that in such a scenario where beta s is equal to 0, we get W B L equal to u times C 2 minus u times multiplied by 1 plus k times cos beta 1 because cos beta 2 is equal to 1 and w 2 has now been simply replaced as c 2 minus u. We can get from this relationship for the special case, I am writing now for the special case what is the power, but you can do the same thing for the generalized case without any harm. So, we can say that coupling power is rho v dot w b l which for the special case of beta s equal to 0 comes uh, down to rho v dot u times c 2 minus u times 1 plus k cos beta 1. Now, this result is interesting. We find that the power will be maximum when the jet velocity C j or C 2 is equal to twice u and the power will be 0 when C j is equal to u. This is very important. Why? Because we are now talking about see the first case is trivially true that when u equal to 0 that is the runner is not rotating then there is no question of power generation. However, even if the runner is rotating you may end up in a scenario when there is no power. One that does that happen when C 2 or the C j that is the jet velocity is equal to the bucket speed and this is called 
the runaway speed. What is runaway speed? In a simple English if I say run away that means something is running away. So, imagine that the nozzle is a human being, nozzle is sending jet of water and hitting the bucket and the bucket is also another human being. Let us say you and your friend. Now, when this there is a gap between the nozzle exit and the bucket. Now, if the jet has a higher velocity, so even if the bucket is trying to run away, is trying to move away, it will hit the bucket. But when the limit comes, when the jet velocity is equal to the bucket rotational speed, then what happens? The bucket is not going to be hit, so there is no contact. So, we are talking about the runaway speed and that is not desirable. So, when there is no load, we are talking about the speed going to runaway speed and that brings us to the important question of how we can regulate the flow. So, you understand we are talking about the power, this power will be maximum when the jet velocity is twice the rotational speed, you can do this calculation yourself and prove that what I am saying makes sense and power will be 0 is trivially true when u equal to 0 and when c 2 equal to u this bracketed term goes to 0. Before I go into the regulation of Pelton turbine, let us talk about the need. Let us say we do not want the turbine to go for to the runaway speed and there is a scenario when there is no power extraction. So, power is 0, the it has tripped, so we have to somehow stop the turbine. You may say what is the problem? I will just bring the spear and block the nozzle. Even if I assume that you have a mechanism by which instantaneously you can bring the spear and block the nozzle, it is not desirable from the hydrodynamic point of view. You will end up getting what is known as a fluid transient phenomenon of water hammer. How do I visualize water hammer? Imagine that we all are fluid particles and in that fluid particles we are going from the penstock through the nozzle we are issuing out as a jet and suddenly this spear comes and instantaneously blocks the nozzle exit. In that case what happens? I if I am a fluid particle, if I were a fluid particle I will see that the suddenly the road is blocked by I want to escape. So, then I will turn back and in this process the gap between the two uh, fluid particles let us say between you and me it reduces. So, there is a compression wave and then we try to escape from the other route that is up the penstock and then we find that we cannot go that part and then we reflect back. So, this creates what is known as a compression and rarefaction waves and the fluid in this case the liquid actually behaves as a compressible flow. So, this gives rise to a very high pressure in the piping system and the piping system gets damaged. So, water hammer pressure or the fluid transient phenomenon called water hammer has to be avoided and hence even if it is possible theoretically to bring the spear and block that water instantaneously, it is not desirable. So, what we can do alternately? We can say that we can bring a deflector, this deflector in a normal position is open which allows the jet to go unhindered and hit the bucket. When it is required, when we want to stop the turbine, two things can be done. One is we can use the brake nozzle, do you remember the brake nozzle? We talked about the brake nozzle which actually acts on the opposite side of the bucket and tries to slow down. So, we can engage the brake nozzles when we are trying to slow down the turbine and simultaneously engage this deflector. As the name suggests the deflector actually deflects the fluid and when it deflects the fluid the jet comes out of the nozzle very true, but it does not go straight and hit the bucket it gets deflected and falls and then we have enough time to bring the spear slowly and close it. So, that water hammer pressure does not take place and hence the regulation of Pelton turbine is done where we talking about the 
flow regulation. This brings us to an end of this discussion on Pelton turbine. Of course, we will take up some problems when we do the tutorials to do get the mathematics correctly. So, now we summarize that, that we have talked about the definition of net head. We have also talked about the classifications of the turbines based on different uh, yardsticks, direction of flow, impulse reaction, but most importantly based on the specific speed. We have talked about the structure and components of Pelton turbine and we have also talked about the flow regulation which is required. With this I conclude the discussion on Pelton turbine. We will continue the discussion on hydraulic turbine in the next lecture when we talk about the reaction turbines namely Francis and Kaplan turbines and there we will also introduce the concept of the structure called draft tube. Thank you.